Thank you for being a part of today's study in the Gospel of Matthew. Our hope in studying this Gospel is that God will use the study to make us more like Jesus. One helpful way of reading is to see yourself as a part of the story. So try one of these options out as we read the story of the centurion who came to Jesus with a serious concern. Here's an option. Maybe you could be on the fringes, part of the crowd who's just checking things out. Or maybe you're one of Jesus' followers. A man who's a member of a hated race of people has just appeared. How do you think Jesus is going to react to him? How do you feel about what Jesus has to say to him? Or you could be that Roman official. You're desperate to get help from Jesus for your servant. Let's read. So we're reading Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. When he'd entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Lord, my servant is paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word, my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and another one, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Let's think about the historical setting. Capernaum was where Jesus lived when he was not traveling in the northern territory of Israel conducting his ministry. The centurion was a Roman official who probably had a hundred soldiers under his direction. The centurion's servant was paralyzed. There was no medical treatment for that. So he came to Jesus for help, believing he was a Jewish healer. At this point in Jesus' ministry, people didn't know what to think about him. Little by little, Jesus revealed the exact nature of who he was and what was his mission. The centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant, and Jesus agreed to travel to his house and help. But the official knew Jesus would receive great criticism from entering the house of a Gentile. That's why he said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just say the word, my servant will be healed. Well, the official understood authority. Authority answered the question, who's in control here? Among his soldiers, the centurion had authority to command their obedience. He believed Jesus was in control over sickness and health. And Jesus could command paralysis to leave, health to return. Now, people who read this account today are thrilled by how the servant was healed. People in the crowd, possibly even Jesus' disciples, would certainly be troubled by his statement about the centurion's faith. When Jesus said, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith, that would have disturbed and angered the crowd. The soldiers were often made up of Syrian mercenaries. To think that someone like that had greater faith than a good Jew was quite troubling indeed. And Jesus' next words probably became the top topic of gossip in this largely Jewish town. He said, I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom, those Jews in that town, will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus flipped the switch, the script, and he applied words that were normally reserved for Jewish people to Gentiles. So if you've been imagining yourself to be in the crowd, you're probably murmuring with seething anger with others in the crowd. Jesus has just offended your racial views to the max. But Jesus told the centurion, go, let it be done for you as you believed. And the centurion's faith was demonstrated that's the belief. His faith was demonstrated by coming to Jesus in the first place, and it was further emphasized when he acknowledged that Jesus had authority over sickness. Well, nobody in the crowd knew whether the servant was healed or not until a report came from the centurion's home, and they learned that the servant was healed at that very moment. So let's make an application to our lives, and let's think about what the people in the crowd thought. How about the centurion? It would be good for you and for me to get in touch with times when we've been desperate for help, just like the centurion. 
How did you feel when you came to Jesus? Did the centurion's example give you some new ideas about how to come to Jesus in times of trouble? Maybe you saw yourself as part of the crowd. Well, think about somebody that you believe to be outside the reach of God's grace. And ask yourself if people like that actually have faith. Even more, is it possible that their faith could be greater than yours? Or what about the followers of Jesus? If you saw yourself as one of Jesus' followers, what did you learn about Jesus' authority? If you saw his authority over sickness in a new life, will it make a difference in how you pray? Let's talk about prayer for a moment. We're going to talk about power. We can be like the centurion and bring the needs of people to Jesus. As we meditate on what we can do, let's think about five kinds of power that we have. Power number one, who we are. Samuel Gordon has said, we may serve better in the lives we live than in the best service we ever give. I'd ask you to think about that statement for a while and come up with your idea about what he's getting at. Number two, what we say. Proverbs tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Number three kind of power, what we do. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Number four power is money. It's not what we keep, but what we release for God's purposes. And again, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. But number five is prayer. James tells us, you do not have because you do not ask. I want you to notice the certain Turian could not help his servant with any of the first four avenues of power. His money, his personality, his actions, and what he was able to do were all powerless before his paralysis. He used the fifth and most effective avenue of power, prayer. He brought his need to Jesus, and Jesus did the rest. When we surrender our self-centered, self-pleasing life to the control and direction of God, He is able to use all five of the realms of power to benefit people around us. Each of us has a role. But today's Bible passage highlights the great value of prayer. Like the centurion, prayer is simply coming to Jesus with our need. Like the centurion, prayer believes that Jesus has authority and is in control over all issues of life. Like the centurion, Prayer invites Jesus into the situations of our lives to say the word of healing or of other issues in life. And like the centurion, prayer rests the results with Jesus. I hope you do something with this message today. We're studying the life and ministry of Jesus with the purpose of learning how to live a Jesus kind of life. As we interact with this slice of life from Jesus' ministry, Let's think of a situation that we believe only Jesus can help. There may be a relationship that's in trouble. Coronavirus is threatening the health of parents and school-aged children and jobs, all sorts of things. People are in the clutches of addiction. Racial inequalities are realities that are quite concerning. Or you may have another issue that's pressing on your heart. Why don't you take this issue that most concerns you Use the example of this Bible passage to bring your concern to Jesus and use the most powerful of the five powers, prayer, to see what God does. Why don't we pray together? Dear Jesus, thank you for this story of your great love and power. Thank you for showing us how you love all people, even people who are very different from us. Thank you for showing us the power of coming to you in prayer. Please help us to use all the avenues of power that you've placed under our disposal especially the power of prayer. We thank you. We give you praise. Amen. Thanks for being a part. God bless you. See you tomorrow.